Good afternoon, everybody. Today, we are going to continue our uh, Kim's Cuddles neonatal uh, uh, series. So in that, actually, uh, uh, we decided that we'll have a neonatal surgery topic. And uh, I thought, actually, we'll give, I, uh, being a chief pediatric surgeon of uh, Kim's Cuddles neonatology and covering all the Hyderabad Kim's Cuddles hospitals. So I thought, actually, I'll just give an overview of all the pediatric surgical aspects then in the coming sessions, actually, we can go in detail into all the uh, sub subtopics. So this is one of the favorite uh, topic of mine, actually, which I feel actually it should spread more into the neonatal and pediatric doctors communities. So this is about actually abdominal distension in a new unit. I'll just share actually a few slides actually just to share uh, what are the things actually we often see. Often we find ourselves in similar, situ similar situations like this, where we'll be thinking what to do in this baby. So one day I got a call from uh, one NICU, and uh, it is about a abdominal extension in it, uh, or something like uh, some 25, 30 days baby. And uh, in that baby, actually, uh, he had a little bit of diarrhea some, some days back, and abdominal distension is there. And it is leading to distress, and maybe the child is going to into ventilation. And uh, these are all the information that clearly I got from the neonatologist. So there is no vomiting, and uh, baby is not passing stools. And uh, I asked about X-ray, as they said that clearly there is no airflow level seen in the X-ray. And all that that clearly uh, the doctor was telling is, please come as soon as possible. They are not able to make out what it is. With this clinical history, uh, we find uh, what I understood is there is no bilious aspirate, there is no aspirate. They're not able to pass uh, NG tube also, and uh, patient is not able to pass tools. And they tried, uh, they we tried actually to pass a flatus tube that is also not going inside. And uh, so all that I'm asking is, what do you think? And uh, all that they are telling is, come as soon as possible. So when I went actually and uh, to see the baby, actually all this is what all that I can see. The saturations are differential in both upper limbs and lower limbs. Lower limbs are actually definitely duskier than the upper limbs, and uh, patient is already on ventilator, and it's not maintaining with that uh, best ventilator settings as well. So when I saw the baby, actually this is what I am trying, trying to see. So the upper part of the abdomen is different and the lower part of the abdomen is congested. So as you can see, actually the anus is pouting. Actually, uh, the, that's why they are not able to pass any stools. Actually, what we are seeing is actually the posterior rectal wall, which is uh, coapting onto the uh, anterior abdominal op opening, uh, anterior handle opening. So we could see that actually there is a differential uh, blood supply also. The blood supply is going upwards into the, on the veins of the abdominal wall. So when I saw the X-ray, actually the feeding tube is going down, but it is going almost till here and uh, above the diaphragm it is going up. So there is no such uh, tracheal fistula which will go all the way to the uh, uh, to the. In Coiling will not be like that. So that's why it means uh, we understood something is not completely correct. And uh, all that you are seeing is all loops are equally similarly distended, but no airflow levels at all. And there is absence of rectal gas because the intestines are pressing all over into the abdomen and uh, out of the abdomen, actually, we are not, gas is not able to ex escape. And uh, in this actually uh, film, actually we can see that actually feeding tube is going till some one point into the bladder. It is not going into the urinary bladder. So, so from this actually we understood actually abdomen is totally shut, and uh, there's no way that we can go. So now the clinical diagnosis that we have is actually abdominal compartment syndrome. So in this. Prevention is the first uh, first point, and early suspicion. The moment you have a suspicion, and you have to put the NG tube, you have to put the bladder. So somehow you have to decompress the bladder, so you decompress the abdomen. The easiest way to assess the bladder pressure, actually abdominal wall pressure, is by uh, taking direct re record reading from the indirect reading from the uh, urinary bladder. So early intervention is the key if we want to allow the baby to su succeed in his life. So the gold standard, as I said, actually is the uh, bladder uh, pressure made uh, measurements. So newborns, it will be slightly different, actually, uh, but more or less it is in the pediatric age, it is like that. Inter normal abdominal pressure is around 5 mm Hg, 
and uh, whenever we suspect intra-abdominal hypertension, which is uh, indirect evidence of, from the bladder pressures, so if it is recorded four to six hours apart, and if it is high, if it is more than 12 mm, yes, we should call it as an intra-abdominal hypertension. It will go into intra-abdominal syndrome, so better to treat it before itself. I just jotted down a few of the conditions actually where uh, intra-abdominal hypertension causes are there, which are potential causes for actually, uh, in, uh, abdominal compartment syndrome. So the common things that we, we commonly see uh, in uh, an issue setting is uh, necrotizing enterocolitis. So quite often actually we'll be just waiting on the necrotizing enterocolitis. We don't know where to start, where, where, where to go. So we'll be just waiting, we'll be watching with six hourly x-rays or 12 hourly x-rays or daily x-rays, whatever is the NAC protocol. So, and as sometimes NAC, uh, NAC can go into perforation. Perforation is uh, a place where uh, definitely the child is going, going into intraabdominal hypertension and um, compartment syndrome. That's why in most of the places, actually, what we do is actually as pediatric uh, good pediatric surgeons, we tend to put first the drain and then wait. Means let the hemodynamically the baby stabilize completely. Then actually we'll proceed with actually any further treatment actually which is required. Means then we'll be arranging the blood, then we'll be arranging the FFP, then we'll be talking to the anesthetist, and then we'll be arranging the operation theater, which usually takes many hours. Uh, so in the meanwhile, in that golden hour, actually we are able to uh, decompress the abdomen gradually, slowly. That is important. So any type of gaseous distension uh, can lead to um, abdominal compartment syndrome. So finally, actually they're going to get into, into MOTS and then actually the, it'll lead to death of the baby. So pathophysiological effects of the abdominal compartment syndrome, overall it is because of the actually oral abdominal distension, upward uh, displacement of the diaphragm and lower border, border also it is uh, not allowing to uh, decompress by any means. So this will overall lead to the pressure on the IBC and then it will lead to um, concerns. So coming to the main aspect important aspect of this is prevention so prevention actually uh, sometimes actually even a burns case actually you would try to give actually aggressively fluids so fluids should be given but not to a major extent so again i'm coming back to the points so early suspicion early diagnosis and timely but slow decompression like how we did in uh, perforation we just put a drain so the timely decompression is very important and uh, a, a complete decompressive laparotomy is not the first line of treatment. So sometimes what happens if it will be too late. Actually, we did uh, this case actually in the NAC itself, actually uh, the baby could not survive. So in front of my eyes, pink uh, intestines became actually uh, dusky and they lost the uh, texture. So abdominal compartment syndrome is a, a very lethal condition which should be timely managed and uh, evaluated and taken care of. So high level of suspicion and timely management is the take home message which I want. This, uh, of course, actually, this is a pure and neonatology topic actually that uh, we, we should all be worried about. So again, actually, uh, as a uh, good pediatric doctors, actually, all of us actually will try to give the best because uh, that that eye is very important actually in any. Uh, diagnosis of any newborn problems because actually baby is not going to tell us anything and uh, it is uh, mothers yeah, or surgeons or pediatricians or neonatologists that eye is very important like, then that is the time when we are like Sherlock Holmes so over 20 years of my practice actually what I understood is when not to operate it's a tough decision and uh, one definitely learns with experience. And all of us in the beginning, actually, we think that, yes, I can do it, I will do it at any cost. But it is not correct. Actually, the timing of any surgery or any intervention or any management is very important. So I jotted down a few of the conditions. Actually, uh, at the moment, actually, as a neonatal doctor, uh, you will be asked, uh, doctor, actually, my child has got a well head. Should I operate tomorrow itself, today itself? So, for that, actually, we should have answers. So, hernia is a semi emergency, especially if it is going into irreducibility, it is an indication for surgery. So, otherwise, actually, we can just sometimes actually drag on on a hernia, uh, taking care of uh, all the precautions and uh, seeing that actually it is not going to irreducibility or obstruction because, uh, anyhow, it is in front of our eyes or within our reach, we'll be able to manage. 
Hydrocele, yes, there are many hydrocele which we see in the newborn period, but none of them we operate. And only we operate actually uh, after uh, one or two years for it to naturally regress. We'll give some time. And undescended testes, yes, actually it's a parental concern. And we don't operate actually in the newborn period. Actually, only uh, after six months, actually we see if we wait for this first six months, actually so it spontaneously uh, descend by itself as, as a natural progression. And since actually sometimes we see actually we don't open the uh, fingers actually we'll open because actually these two fingers will start actually opening actually uh, uh, with discrepancy will start increasing after one year of age. So usually we wait till one year of age and then only we'll try to open them. And it's not a simple operation; it's a complex operation because we have to take multiple flaps, and then actually we have to adjust uh, and so that the contracture should not come. So we have to take one full thickness graft and then do it. Phimosis, yes, it is physiological in the first infancy, first year of life. So phimosis should never be operated, actually, unless it is actually uh, a major issue. And then also we'll tend to do a proportional edicialysis as compared to circumcision. So hypospadias is something actually which will be very annoying for all the parents because uh, they'll be very proudly telling everyone actually, hey, a boy or girl. But to, the, to their surprise, actually, sometimes actually uh, there will be a uh, uh, some uh, disorders of dis uh, sexual dysfunction where we cannot differentiate between a hypospadias, the ASD, or uh, is it a uh, female child or a congenital adrenal hypoplasia? So that is when actually uh, we have to wait on the child, we have to tell the parents, we have to counsel the parents, and then uh, wait, wait for the karyotyping. Till that time, reassure the parents. And if it is a clear cut hypospadias, we usually we don't operate till one year of age. Some people do go for six months of age, but usually we tend to go for uh, two years of age. So one 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 year of age, and ideally the we have to finish the hypospadias operation before the third year because so after third year actually a child knows whether he's a boy or he's a girl, and second thing there'll be a genital fear after third year of life. So and at third year actually parents will be thinking of putting him into the school before the child goes to school actually it needs to be uh, managed. So often we see cleft lips and palates. Lip usually we operate after the third month of age, and uh, cleft palate actually we operate at after one year of age. So that actually the malar uh, eminence will start increasing till the proper complete uh, uh, growth of the malar bone happens. We usually wait. So now there's a readers and more recent concepts are go towards early reconstructive surgeries as compared to the traditional surgeries, which uh, we used to do actually um, maybe actually. Uh, Half decade or decade ago, but uh, it is a, uh, a completely uh, as per the surgeon's discretion. So the recent trends in neonatal surgery, which are helping in uh, as in giving the best outcomes to the children, are so like we discussed single stage operations in anatomical malformations, Hirsch films, and many urological procedures. We are trying to do single stage operations. Apart from that. Laparoscopy and thoracoscopy uh, have made a significant change in a neonatal surgeon's life, pediatric surgeon's life, and we are able to give the best outcome to uh, families. And uh, cystoscopy also, at least, advent of cystoscopy has uh, definitely uh, revolutionized our pediatric urological work. We are able to do actually everything in a single stage, and, and there's the primary phase itself. Earlier they used to do whether cost me wait till one year or two years of age, and then they'll decide actually what to do. So, but luckily at least uh, the advent of cystoscopy, we have neonatal cystoscopes actually where we are doing the primary formation of the valves or post valves, which we were not able to do it 50 years back. And uh, bronchoscopy uh, definitely is a, a, a helping us a lot in neonatal surgery, especially a uh, simple medic meconium. Actually, that is quite common. Actually, whenever it is there, so we are stuck with the adelectasis and uh, there will be uh, emphysematous changes. So all these things actually when being just cleared by doing a simple bronchoscopy, uh, be it flexible or uh, rigid, and then we are able to remove it. Foreign bodies are really there, but actually they can be there in the neonatal age group as well. But uh, in, especially for us, actually, at a case of tracheal fistula, actually, we are able to do bronchoscopy and then we are able to see, identify where is the fistula, and then we'll proceed accordingly. Sometimes what happens, there will be double fistula, actually, upper post fistula and a lower post fistula. This can be diagnosed before, actually, if we have a bronchoscopy in hand. And robotic surgery, yes, actually, does not uh, come into pediatric neonatal surgery as well. 
as have up to now and but uh, definitely it's going to um, you know it's revolutionized uh, pediatric surgical work and it is going to be the the uh, revolutionary thing in the um, next half decade uh, i'll start with simple things and common things actually uh, uh, often actually a neonatal surgery is actually breast tests which sometimes i breast milk will start to me sometimes the, the parents will try to express uh, violently vigorously it will lead to breast abscess and then the best abscess and the best treatment is any abscess and the treatment is complete drainage of the abscess. So, or else actually it is going to lead to what is called as an antibioma. It is very difficult to manage. It will almost mimic like a cancer or the treatment will be like a oncosurgery only. So, so antibiotics work till one extent, but after the pus develops, like pus forms, actually there is no role, no, no much role for um, uh, antibiotics. Yes, antibiotics will be uh, taking care of it after the uh, drainage of the first. So, uh, the most important point actually I tell most of the, and we, we were taught and we, I tell most of the people, uh, my juniors is, find out actually if it is a hemangioma or not. Both are red, but check whether it is hemangioma or not. So, always actually uh, we uh, tend to give, uh, put a needle, aspirate, if a frank blood is coming, we just uh, abandon the procedure. We'll think that it is a case of a hemangioma and then we'll abandon. Or else if it is a pus, just drain the pus. So next topic will be a hemangioma. Hemangioma is where actually there is abnormal proliferation. It's a hematoma where abnormal proliferation of the vasculature uh, red results will be there. So depending on which level it is, actually uh, if the skin, adequate skin, it's just below the skin, it will become red. If it is slightly below, actually it will become like a bumpy swelling and it is compressible. So that uh, what we were taught is actually just do mastery in activity. Don't be in a hurry to operate unnecessarily unless it is leading to some major obstructive things for the airway or uh, oral cavity. So if at all, if those things are there, actually then we'll be trying to do partial excision or actually then we'll be, or we'll be going for uh, injections of some sclerosants. But uh, the, now, nowadays, the trend is more towards propranolol. Propranolol is one, uh, one working wonders for uh, hemangioma. It's a real boon for actually all the pediatric surgeons because the hemangioma operation will lead to uh, disfigurement of the face or any structure. So we can avoid a significant big scar, actually, if at all, if we can use propranolol and shrink it. Or it will allow us to shrink to such an extent and later the surgery will be slightly smaller. So this is one of our cases actually where actually we were we used uh, hemangioma uh, propranolol for hemangioma, and then actually with that actually they are over age actually yes actually there will be a little bit of uh, disfigurement or features, but with little bit of uh, facial things uh, all the girls will be able to manage, and uh, yes, literally we are able to avoid a big scar. Scar definitely will give, lead to a lot of disfigurement as compared to this, uh, these final things. So similar conditions in the neck, actually what we find is uh, cystic hygroma. It is a uh, partially compressible uh, swelling and it is seen in around 40% of the uh, newborns and within the few first month itself actually we'll be able to see most of the cystic hygromas, but sometimes actually they, some are present later if they're really very small. So one pre prenatal scans have significantly increased the uh, pickup rate. So usually the parents come to us for antenatal counseling with a surgical problem, telling the doctor, my child has got this, what to do. So then we'll be uh, doing the uh, management planning. So the management is pre-planned prior to the birth and in most of the surgical conditions which are detected antenatally and uh, we'll be able to detect it very early. So especially when those which are having a tongue base involvement, base of the tongue, or a laryngeal involvement, usually we don't do anything even in the newborn period or neonatal period. So uh, there are many cosmetic aspects as well involved in this uh, uh, cystic hygroma management. So we have to decide whether it is a microcystic variant or macrocystic variant. This is very important. Or those with have which have got significant solid components, especially if solid components are there, and uh, those are the conditions actually where child may go for surgery. 
So, and microcystic variant, yes, exactly. Uh, not, uh, not much of uh, medical management or injection screening that we will work. So, but there are some few conditions actually where right, we have we find actually C3 or 4 or few multiple, uh, few big cystic lesions, especially when those uh, cystic lesions are there. Those are the conditions actually where uh, we tend to give at least some injections, uh, sclerosins, something like a bleomycin, uh, which is really working about this. So that definitely shrinks the sizes that are swelling. And uh, later, actually, even if you want to operate, actually we'll be operating with a very minimal scar and at a later date. So, so cosmetic aspects and uh, timing of the surgeries are very important things like which uh, we should be worried about in this case. So often we see actually umbilical problems. Out of all the umbilical problems, we try to go in between, in, in short and or in detail. So often we uh, uh, as uh, neonatal doctors that we will be uh, dealing with umbilical discharge. So my child is getting umbilical discharge after the 10th day after after the fall of the umbilical uh, dried up umbilical cord also. So usually often we see it, it is still healing. It will take, it is going to take some more time. So often what we see is uh, umbilical granuloma. So whenever umbilical granuloma is there, the, as usually we use chemical cauterization like using common salt. And then if uh, earlier we used to use copper sulfate and silver nitrate, but these are uh, relatively risky for the surrounding skin. So we stopped doing all these things. So all that we are using is a common salt and then wait for some time, actually give some more time. So sometimes actually we can extend it till the three months of age. But after three months of age, if it is still persisting, then it means actually some of the communications actually is still persisting, which is causing the um, discharge or pus or blood. So it can be usually the one which is connected to the bladder, which is the patent uracus, or it can be the one which is connected to the small bone, which is the uh, plated bit low intestinal duct. So whatever it is actually, as, uh, we have to tackle these two conditions surgically. So Tante is one condition actually, which often we see actually, uh, often we, call, we, have, we will be called, uh, can you release the tongue by now itself in the newborn period? So most of the newborns actually, whenever the guy actually, we will be seeing the frenulum. That doesn't mean that actually he has a tongue tie. So even if a tongue tie is there, so the only indication for that is actually they are not able to latch properly. That too, after excluding all the reasons for latching, then we have to think about actually tongue tie uh, as a cause for latching uh, difficulty. So needs really is at uh, one year of age. Actually, uh, means actually if we see our uh, whatever uh, the uh, Telugu or Hindi language that we uh, learned, so whatever we are taught, actually it is taught in a systematic manner. So all the letters are framed in such a way that actually we'll be using either the lips or the tongue or uh, thing. So this started at another exactly line, actually it's all uh, it's, uh, based on uh, uh, T word, then uh, it is because uh, the tongue is not uh, approximating over the uh, palate. So then actually there will be speech difficulty. So a tongue tie release will help a child in getting only these letters. So I often ask actually a, a mother to send a video or a photograph uh, telling the actually whether when the tongue is protruded, is it a V or a v, is it a W? So a homework by parent is very important. And often we try to delay it by one year of age. And uh, sometimes actually they are in, uh, uh, we do glossopexia, so reversal of uh, reverse of what we are, we are talking about tongue tie. So, um, in general, actually, I thought actually I'll just cover actually our uh, neonatal surgery, and uh, later we'll be going into the detailed aspects of the neonatal surgery. Some interesting uh, pictures actually I wanted to show actually means very rarely you find actually uh, meconium coming from the urethra. That is called a meconium. So whenever meconium is there. Uh, no, obviously all the neonatal, neonatal doctors actually they'll be passing a uh, tube from above, tube from below. This is the standard uh, procedure actually which we were following actually over years. But nowadays actually some people tell actually no need to pass actually uh, even the staining. So, but invariably our rectal like, will pass tend to pass a fain tube, and then we need to see the proper rectal staining uh, with the meconium tube staining with the meconium. So anorectal malformation can be divided actually uh, into latest uh, classification is the Krickenberg classification. I won't go into the detail. 
we'll do it in the next uh, coming uh, sessions. So antiretinal malformation, it will be I can divide it into the major clinical groups and some rare regional types. Sometimes actually pouch pollen is more common in the North India. It is less common in South India, something like that. So something like rectal uh, atrish, uh, stenosis, rectovaginal fistula, it's very common. Uh, one spina actually directly communicated with me. So actually in America, we all, almost hardly we see uh, rectovaginal fistula. Though he's a pioneer in it, he said that he hardly sees uh, uh, rectovaginal fistulas and uh, H type fistulas. And this is some other, and some other rare variants are also there. So, which needs to be addressed separately, individually, and it is a case based uh, approach. So, in neonatal surgery or pediatric surgery, interesting part is no two cases are uh, similar. So, sometimes, actually, even in a simple appendix, I tell uh, most of my colleagues, actually, I tell, actually, don't think that appendix is a simple operation. I can do it. And no two sim single appendix are also equal or uh, they, they present totally differently. Coming back to the anorectal malformation, it can be starting from a simple anal, anal stenosis. Uh, anorectal malformation, sometimes they will not have fistulas. And uh, and sometimes even males, and uh, sometimes there'll be a perineal fistula or a spontaneous fistula or a urethral fistula, but it'll be a prostatic urethral fistula or bulbar urethral fistula, and uh, sometimes they directly communicate with the urinary bladder, and uh, there sometimes actually in females actually we'll have a vestibular fistula, and uh, sometimes we have a common where uh, all the three are, three openings are opening into the common channel. If the common channel is more than three centimeters, more or less than three centimeters, is uh, why we uh, have to know all these things accordingly. Is actually the management is totally different. So prognosis is different. We have to prognosticate. Parent the first question before on starting the operation, they will ask is actually uh, is my child going to be fine? So. The basis for decision and planning in anorectal malformation uh, depends on the how how much to what extent the rectal gases come. So what is the lower end of the rectal pouch? So what we used to do earlier is we used to do an invertebram. But nowadays, actually, all of us, actually, all the pediatric surgeons, we have moved on to uh, cross table prone lateral film of uh, where we'll be putting the patient in a comfortable sleeping position with little bit buttocks elevated, and then we'll be shooting a lateral film. And that will tell, and after two or three minutes of uh, waiting, actually, we'll be seeing actually how is the uh, lowermost part of the uh, gas which is able to come. That will decide actually what is the extent, whether it is a low, intermediate, or high angle malformation. Uh, in the coming sessions, actually, we'll be discussing with showing the X-rays, actually, uh, what is eye point, what is a seat line. So, uh, type of fistula and location of the fistula also makes a lot of difference in the prognostication, actually, whether uh, the child is going to have uh, good sphincters or less sphincters. And uh, other thing which uh, is a major thing is associated malformations. So we talk about water bacterial malformations. So if these are associated, actually they are going to uh, help in telling us uh, the parents actually what is going to the overall uh, long term outcomes and morbidity of the patient. So just I'll go through a few of the pictures actually. Uh, so. The area is anus will be uh, within the way of vestibule, actually, that is called vestibular anus. And then actually, it can be at various levels uh, from the normal anal position to the uh, till the vision. So, often, actually, sometimes, actually, uh, my uh, teacher used to tell if you don't put a finger in the anus, actually, you are going to land in big trouble. So, and he used to tell the only contraindication for uh, not doing a pediatric examination is. Uh, if there is an imperfect anus, there is no hole in the anus, in the anal area. So we can miss anal malformation very easily, and definitely those people are going to land in the major uh, medical issues. So always try to see uh, anal orifice. And the other thing is actually whether we have to see if the anal stenosis is there. This is a common cause of uh, constipation. So if our little finger can go into the area, new ones can will allow a little finger to go inside. So a PR attempt can easily uh, diagnose and rule out an anal stenosis. So the surgery is simple, but actually the diagnosis is very important. So anal stenosis can present very late. Actually, exactly last time we operated in a case which is of around uh, two or three years old. 
because you, that is when actually usually the constipation is present. So per rectal was not possible and the anaplasty we, we was done. And urological assessment we have to do uh, because associated uh, renal anomalies can be there or UR can be there. So sometimes we see what is called as a perineal canal, where there's a uh, typical canal, actually the baby will be passing sometimes stools from the uh, uh, vaginal infoitus. So uh, ASRP or PSRP or the team, so the operations that we do, actually that is going to be a permanent solution. After that, anal malformation, we often talk about Hirschsprung's disease. So what is Hirschsprung's disease? So a progressive constipation, starting from the newborn period itself, day one, day two, and then it will keep on progressing and uh, the baby will come to us with a bloated belly if it is not detected in the newborn period. So not every Hirschsprung's can be detected in the newborn period. So we should not feel upset actually if we miss uh, Hirschsprung's. So ongoing uh, Hirschsprung's uh, constipation is a thing. And the reversed uh, recto sigma ratio is what we see in the um, contrast or uh, any mother we do. So in a newborn, actually, whenever we do, all the proximal loops of the dilate uh, will be equally dilated and distended. So that is one other classical finding which we see in a case of Hirschsprung's and uh, absent rectal gas. And then and contrast cinema will show there is reverse abs, reversal of um, recto sigma ratio. So this is what a classical recto sigma ratio uh, reversal will be there. And all the recto sigma is uh, accounts to around 70% and this is a classical segment. So we have to identify, we'll be easily able to identify the transition zone, especially for long segments, actually we'll be missing the uh, transition zones. And uh, something like a total pulling again, we may be missing on the transition zones, but uh, high clinical suspicion is the one actually which allows the neonatal surgeons to detect it and then proceed with the laparotomy. That too, with uh, so many uh, doubts, actually, and we'll be uh, giving them actually with various differential diagnosis, something like meconium ileus, exit atresia, or, um, or neonatal intestinal dysplasia. So, we often do a colostomy, which is around five to seven centimeters above the uh, transition zone, because in this area, actually, there can be associated uh, still. Uh, uh, hypogangliosis. Usually that's why we take a, a full donut of the colon and then we send it for a biopsy, especially when we are doing a Hartman's procedure. So again, I am insisting actually a single stage procedures have got their own advantages and more than anything, a stigma, a social stigma of having a colostomy at home, uh, all these things can be decreased. So definitely cost effective for most of the Indian families and uh, lesser duration of hospitalization and lesser uh, hospital visits. But the bottom line is surgeon's discretion. As per the uh, patient status, actually, surgeon will decide actually, whether this child is feasible for uh, a single stage or not. So the standard procedure that we tend to do is actually the three stage procedures. One is first we'll do a uh, colostomy, pull through, and then colostomy closure. And uh, in an malformation, if it is a uh, Hirschman, actually, we'll be doing a colostomy and a pull through for Hirschman's disease. But definitely, uh, it is a social stigma for the family. But uh, often we try to explain actually how to take care of the baby. And uh, usually, the parents do well. And but whenever uh, possible and feasible, we are trying to give them a single stage option. Single stage has got its own advantages, and uh, but it should be used very carefully, and uh, it is patient dependent. So this is a case of actually Hirschman's just to differentiate between actually uh, how a colostomy, if it is done in a later age, will be looking at so scary looking, and if at all if it is do it in the newborn period itself, this is what is called a transcranial uh, procedure of endorectal pull through procedure for Hirschman's, actually, which is a single stage procedure. We are doing a quite a uh, Deal uh, quite often and cho choosing carefully. So, esophageal atresia is another uh, newborn surgery that actually all of us uh, will be very much fanciful about. So, esophageal atresia can be of uh, various types. And these are the only the five types which we talked about, but actually, there are some hundreds of variants actually which are, they are described in the uh, history. And these are the regular ones. The upper pouch suctioning with replogal tube or some other tube and is very important or else actually there will be continuous lung soiling the more lung soiling is there the more uh, bad will be the bad will be the prognosis so early uh, surgery definitely reduces the lung soiling so after the basic evaluation if possible it would go so we will uh, plan for early operation uh, the next day itself actually will be planning for surgery 
and the recent advance actually which is coming in the management of uh, easily efficient is thoracoscopy so we are uh, starting our procedures with thoracoscopy and we are able to do it successfully and uh, whichever are not feasible or wherever the baby's condition is not accepting definitely we are going for the open thoracotomy operation actually in the traditional standard technique so in most of the cases actually we tend to add uh, safety is more important than being more heroic so it is, if it is a case of pure atresia uh, without fistula definitely it needs a esophagus of the gastrostomy and then we'll be doing the definitive pull through procedures uh, pull up procedures at one year of age so the next to most important actually most fanciful word of all the neonatal doctors is diaphragmatic hernia so we have to uh, every diaphragmatic hernia i always tell like is totally different so now no two diaphragmatic hernias are same so diaphragmatic hernia uh, we that uh, deal with uh, it, any anything can go into the thorax so if a solid organ is going into the thorax if a stomach which is filled with a uh, fluid amniotic fluid which is almost equal into uh, some cystic bag so it's not like a air bag in a, 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 in a unit it is something like a fluid bag which is filled so if the, that goes also it is like a space of open lesion in the thorax so which will uh, hamper the uh, uh, lung development so so that's why actually uh, all of us actually we believe that actually medical stabilization is most important and safe transfer in utero transfer is the best and uh, nowadays the recent concept is thoracoscopic repair is becoming a gold standard so i add to this actually give enema for all new uh, cases because enema uh, will decompress the thick meconium it will give some space for the for the abdomen so that at least small maybe uh, they'll be able to uh, come down there are various antenatal uh, prognostication uh, factors actually which you talk about and uh, what decides the outcome pre op intra op post operative there are several both prognostic factors some like actually if it is uh, diagnosed at t5 itself before t5 itself yes both prognosis so if stomach and liver solid organs are there and uh, if larger defects are there especially agencies everything goes up and uh, there will be a significant uh, lung hypoplasia so the bottom line here again is the pulmonary hypoplasia actually which will lead to the pulmonary hypertension which is the killer in diaphragmatic hernia so ecmo yes actually in uh, kim sakli we have ecmo actually is really working really wonders and ecmo, ecmo is changing the outcome of a diaphragmatic hernia management as well so but again the bottom line is every cdh case is different so in this case actually we are actually uh, we can see that actually almost everything is there inside so we gave a, a bad prognosis and but we i told actually every case is different so i uh, they came out with a very good outcome and uh, they are they are uh, is a happy child now he's around 2 or 3 years actually uh, right now and uh, uh, i'm very proud to say actually his name is also called uh, he's he for the name him as uh, yogi after me so thoracoscopic diaphragmatic repair actually uh, in the last month itself actually we have done uh, three th thoracoscopic diaphragmatic repairs so this is really working actually a real wonders actually uh, means all that we are leaving on the child chest is actually three uh, small holes with these three small holes actually uh, which will become negligible or invisible in the later life so the child is happy the family is more than happy and uh, this is how actually it will look after the um, diaphragmatic repair is done so most important thing is actually we have to differentiate between a diaphragmatic event patient and diaphragmatic hernia diaphragmatic event patient is different because the lung is spared partially so these are the patients actually who are not going to go become uh, um, uh, uh, pulmonary hypertensive patients so that's why the prognosis is differently better so these diaphragmatic event patients children are the children are the kids who go into later phase of the life not in, not only the uh, newborn neonatal beta so most of the diaphragmatic hernia is actually after medical stabilization surgery is the only option and uh, we are getting actually a fairly decent uh, results earlier we used to tell something like a 70% or 80% or, or less nowadays actually we are all, almost able to tell 90 plus survival rates and uh, of course actually anatomy and uh, uh, lung hypertension is uh, are the deciding factors 
in short about uh, attritional types clear and all we'll be doing in the next uh, session at least there are various types of attritional cycles starting from piece of to the anus so all are, are treated differently and uh, but uh, some things are really uh, bothering for us, especially a uh, general atricious, at least some things which will be bothering and multiple atricious or something like apple peel attrition and general atricious. So these are the things actually uh, which will give a uh, tough time for the uh, neonatal surgeon uh, in post op post operative management because these uh, times are sometimes they you know, go on for two or three months, which requires TPN and uh, extended neonatal care. So, diaphragm medicania, we were discussing it earlier, there are various types. And uh, this is just uh, out of the diaphragm medicania, actually, but a diaphragm medicania. So, this child actually presented late, in the later part of the life, actually, with uh, recurrent uh, lower respiratory tract infections and requiring sometimes actually ventilation. So, later in the x ray, we can clearly see actually there is a thin ring of uh, intestines which are going into the central part of the diaphragm. It is seen on both sides of the diaphragm, actually, uh, both sides of the center part, center of the diaphragm. So, the Diagnosis for this patient is a morganic hernia, and we successfully managed actually uh, with the thoracoscopic or uh, laparoscopic approach, actually, where we put actually negligible scars, which otherwise would have required a big laparotomy like this to do the uh, surgery in such a tiny space. Actually, uh, laparoscopy in children itself is different. Uh, over that, actually, laparoscopical surgical aspect in the small anterior segment, uh, retrosternal area of around two centimeters, it's still more difficult. And in short, about actually pediatric urology. So, neonatal hernia. Start. Let's start with the neonatal hernia. There's so many controversies in, in neonatal surgery uh, and hernia. So, is it parents' first question is: Is it unilateral or bilateral? And uh, should I go for an emergency or elective? Especially in a neonatal surgery, preterms are the ones who are going to get actually uh, hernias. Often they'll be a bilateral or sometimes unilateral. But their physical condition is not ready uh, to, to accept a major uh, anesthesia. So those are the conditions actually where we will uh, selectively decide actually whether actually this child uh, needs to be uh, so, uh, operated as soon as possible, or it should be operated electively in a uh, elective fashion. So we, uh, in a miss over the years, actually, I started giving an option of uh, not as soon as possible and as much as possible elective operation because actually the newborns actually sometimes actually they'll be less than one kg. So anesthesia risk is high. So some parents were not in a condition to take actually uh, any uh, risk of uh, morbidity, mortality, or uh, death. Death. So so especially if it is uncomplicated ones. And if they are living somewhere nearby, somewhere actually, because we are from Hyderabad, actually in the city, at least they are coming in city itself, they can come anytime within less than an hour or two. So we are uh, easily approachable. So an educated family. And these are the indications actually where we can we give the option of elective operation. But if there are something like a litigant families and uh, there is the, and the parents are not compliant, they are not, they can't come, they are very far off. And those are the cases actually we tend to do as soon as possible, taking all the risks. And uh, that recent advance, uh, like laparoscopy, I was talking about. Laparoscopy, the main advantage is actually it'll tell about actually both the sides. A parent will ask, if doctor, you are telling it's on the right side, please will it be there on the left side as well? So, and the answer for open surgery or uh, uh, pediatric surgery is, I don't know, it can come. So instead, actually, the, nowadays the parents want a yes or a no, which is very difficult in most of the cases. But the answer, we can get it only from a laparoscopy. We'll be able to see on the, both the sides, and then we'll be able to manage both the sides at the same time. So coming to the phimosis, I, I said, actually, it is physiological, it is one year of age. So uh, just ballooning of prepuce doesn't indicate, actually, you need surgery. And uh, circumcision alone is not the answer for uh, for most of the urinary tract infections. So it is a long story. Actually, we'll try to do it in the next session in PDA or pediatric urology session. There are many anomalies, actually, uh, renal anomalies and ureter anomalies and bladder anomalies actually we'll be dealing with. And uh, all these things actually we'll, uh, have, we are trying to concentrate in the next pediatric urology session, uh, which will be done by uh, Dr. Rajesh, one of our team members. So evaluation of urinary tract infection doesn't end with uh, 
or start with circumcision. There are many things that it needs to add detailed evaluation to protect the uh, upper tracts. So urethral remnant uh, is something actually that we often see, actually, which we are off, off late actually we are trying to do. Uh, um, uh, sorry. So vesicular reflex is something actually which we may detect in the uh, process in our process of evaluating for uh, urinary tract infection, which can lead to uh, scars. That's why actually early management, early evaluation, and is very important in the case of uh, urinary tract infection with the uh, UR. So postural valve is one thing actually. I always tell actually if you know about postural valve, you know about full uro urology, pediatric urology or neonatal urology. So because one single valve is going to change the life of the full uh, kidney, ureter, and bladder, and uh, overall multi-system disorders as well. So for postural valve, actually once upon a time, actually the treatment for this is actually half decade ago. It is uh, we have to vasectomy and then wait. But with the advent of uh, cystoscopy, recent advance, uh, we are able to do neonatal. Uh, we have neonatal uh, cystoscopes. We are able to do actually primary filigration of the valve. That doesn't end, but that is the beginning of the story. But actually, uh, that is the important part of the uh, first part of the phase. So, or else actually, sometimes actually we may have to do a succumb to uh, do uh, to a uh, vasectomy, but we'll be doing uh, in SOS. So, multicystic dysplastic kidney is something actually that we see sometimes. So, where the, one of the kidney is non functional, we try to explain. And only if it is increasing in size, if it is causing hypertension, if it is causing actually uh, pressure on the inactive system, and if the, it is increasing in size, then only we'll operate, or else most of them actually they'll involute. So laparoscopic nephrectomy is the answer, and uh, with simple scars, actually babies will be able to come out. So hypospadias is uh, as seen in the newborn period. Actually, it is a scary thing for a parent. So for hypospadias, we tell them clearly, don't panic, don't worry, and uh, Oh, we usually do the operation at one year of age, and till that time, we'll uh, try to convince the parents and uh, give some reassurance to the parents. And uh, hydronephrosis, huge obstructions, and natal itself is diagnosed, and we follow up quickly in the postnatal period. It is not an emergency, you have to release the obstruction in the newborn period. We have to follow it up and we'll see how it is going, gradually increasing. If it is rapidly increasing, yes, there are, there are uh, times when we operate in the first week of the um, birth itself, actually, especially when it's going to 50 or 60 yeah. say, uh, millimeters of, uh, uh, millimeters of uh, AP diameter of pelvis. Again, here the laparoscopy is the answer. It is giving us uh, wonderful uh, scars and similar operation and uh, same technique actually we are following. And uh, whatever we are doing actually uh, uh, in the open technique, we are able to translate the same thing onto the laparoscopy surgery also. And uh, robotic surgery is a new trend actually which is helping us in achieving these targets. So mega rotor can be can be because of the reflex or can be because of the obstruction. So duplex MRTs, all these things actually we are going to discuss in our coming sessions. So the blood extrophy uh, as a part of the hypospadias, hypospadias, blood extrophy. So it is a complex uh, procedure actually uh, we'll be deciding, uh, discussing. And then uh, in the coming stages, actually coming uh, sessions. So, so this covers literally all the pediatric urology. And after everything, actually coming to the contents wise. So we are still not uh, completely uh, giving uh, able to give the best uh, outcomes to the families with a normal uh, orifices. So that's when actually we tend to go for bladder uh, catheterizable stomas, or we will be going for augmented bladders. In anorectal malformation, also after the operation is done, it doesn't end with that. They will be going into recurrent urinary tract infections or sometimes stones because there will be some residual vouchers uh, that we are leaving, and uh, these things actually we'll be discussing in. With this, actually, uh, I'll tend, I'll try to stop here, actually, because we are uh, overshooting our time, and uh, maybe we will be crossing your uh, attention span as well. So we have a team of uh, pediatric surgeons here, and uh, myself, I'm Yogan, I'm the pediatric surgeon, uh, I'm the chief, and I'm adding the pediatric surgery unit in uh, Kim's uh, and uh, we have Dr. Manisha, Dr. Pravinash, and Dr. Ashish. So those people will be dealing actually in the coming sessions in detail. And we'll be turning the word into, into pediatric urology, neonatal surgery, laparoscopic, and all the sessions. So 
and uh, one we'll have uh, we'll try to have um, exclusively on antenatal diagnosis where we will be discussing about antenatal aspects of uh, neonatal surgery and how we are able to give uh, the best outcomes in the neonatal surgery thank you very much for your patient visiting we'll continue with our sessions